Today is Monday, where we are. It is Monday, June. It's not June. It's May. <laughs> you all in different months. <laughs> what day is it? Let me look at my phone. It's May 22nd. The way our podcast schedule is usually set up, y'all probably ain't even going to get this to August. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but y'all going to get it like it's fresh. But it's just going to be a right now word whenever you do get it. What did you do this morning? What was your day like? Um, I got up. I lay there for you a minute. got up and laid there. Yeah. That's interesting. I'm going to be real. Because you okay. said got up and laid there. No, I, I woke up. Okay. I woke up. You know, some Christians be trying to act deep. But I saw the Lord's face as soon as I woke up at yeah, yeah, 4 a.m. Yeah. in the yeah, morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't do that. Okay. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be all the way around it. Uh, I, I this got podcast up. gonna be terrible. Huh? No, go ahead. <laughs> no, I got up. I'm kidding. And I, I woke up and I stood and I laid up at the ceiling and I was like, I want to get out of bed, but I didn't. And I was like, you know what? After like 20 minutes, I was like, I should pray. So I prayed. And um and then after that, I just started handling stuff with my clothing line, um, Boat Apparel, where you can get some of the dopest christian merch um out there what's the website since we're here boldapparel.shop okay uh you gonna ask me what i did what you had you did? don't care okay you was doing squats no I not saw, today. i saw your little story not today showing your little thighs no i got up i fed your children i took them to school then i went to the gym today was cardio arm day and core day i've been okay. trying to fix my diastis recti so Yo, I what did. what you say what's your recti diastis recti Huh? So when women have Girl, babies, about rectums. With, wow, <laughs> <laughs> that's obnoxious. <laughs> when women have babies, their abdomens separate to create room and space for the baby. The body is a beautiful thing, but when the baby comes on out, the abdomen is still separated. So the women have to do core work or surgery to allow their abdominal muscles to come back into place. No, you've been putting in work though. So I've that's been, what I've been doing. I've been really inspired by you. You've been putting in work. That's good. You was always fine, but now you just, you know, tighten it up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, okay, okay. No, you know. Being healthy is very much an aesthetic for me. I'm not one of those people <laughs> that's like, oh, health is wealth and I just want to be no, it is an aesthetic. I like how I look when I look a certain way. But it also feels good. It yeah. feels good to be strong. It feels good to be able to get up and not be tired. It feels good to walk up steps with babies and not be, you know what I'm saying, to fall out. You're a different person because I remember after our first child, we was living in a little one small bedroom apart, apartment at Oak Park, Chicago. And our first event, I'll never forget this, our first event, we had a poetry event in Atlanta. Ironically, we live in Atlanta now. I don't remember. Where, I don't know where you're going. Yeah, but I remember the 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 people from the college, we had a poetry event, sent pictures back from the event, and you saw yourself, oh. and you said, oh, my gosh, look at me. I look like a Muppet. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and literally the next day, you was in the gym, and you went to work. I did. I mean, she was so motivated. I call that my, I think everybody, when you're trying, before you lose weight, I think you have to have a trigger moment. Like, and that was my trigger moment, seeing myself in that picture. I was like, wow, I look like a wide mop. <laughs> <laughs> like something has to change. But what's crazy is I lost 60 pounds after, so that was eating. I lost 60 pounds after eating. I lost uh, around 50 pounds after autumn. And now this is me losing sage and August weight. But it's crazy. The older I get, the harder it is. Yeah. It was so, it was so easy with eating. With eating, I cut out ketchup. And drop 10 pounds. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Because you, you know, ketchup, to, it's like 60 you, tablespoons you went, of sugar. Go you, ahead. Went, you went too extreme, though. With who? With, with our first child. Because you ended up losing weight, and then I'm going to run a marathon. And I'm like, <laughs> what? What? I needed a goal. <laughs> it was a goal that I set up. I'm, I'm it like, wasn't extreme. I just was really bony. I won't get that bony again. It's okay. You were skinny. I was. I was about 120. Uh, anyway. let's, get into this, let's get into this. Uh, so what spiders. are we doing? Why are we here? So so uh, some of you guys may remember we did a series called Teach the Text where we opened the Bible and Jackie would either walk through a text or I would walk through a text. And we thought it would be a good idea to bring this series back. Look at you hosting. You, you're showing out oh my in gosh. season 17, oh my whatever gosh. season it is. It's not season 17. I don't know. I, I, I lost count. <laughs> uh, but yeah, man, uh, this story... Genesis 16 about Hagar is a really, really good, good story. Um, you know, 
And I feel like Jackie will be a good person to teach the text because she has been teaching this text. Yeah, I've been I've, on the I've road. Taught this about six times now. Yeah, yeah. So, Seven. so yeah. Let's let's dig into this to this text with Sarah. So, so I could lead with saying I don't know why that's in there, but I, okay. So with Glory, this year's theme was Jesus and women, right? And so I was turning over my mind, like, what text could we walk through? to kind of highlight this idea of Jesus caring for, providing for, being with all the things when it comes to women. Yeah. And I knew I wanted to do uh, The Woman at the Well. That's a really obvious. And I love taking texts that people are familiar with and, and not turning it on its head in terms of heresy, because I think some people can try to find something new in the text and they actually create something new Yeah. versus turning it in such a way where it's like, no, that's always been there. We just haven't had the eyes to see it. Yeah. That's the way I like to And approach. by the way, that's a very hard thing to do if you're trying to do it by your own strength. I think that people need to be trained. when they. Yes. You know, because... I, you have to be trained and developed because you also need a certain amount of discipline to have biblical interpretation. Yeah. Because I've seen where people, they want so bad to find a nugget that they actually read into the text yeah. and they don't see that the actual simple interpretation is just as powerful. Because what's deep, and this is not to criticize people out there, but I think <clears throat> a lot of times I, I see people handling a text and I can identify creativity there. Yeah. Like, you no, know, you're a creative person, I can just tell. Mm -hmm. The text ain't saying that though. <laughs> <laughs> It's no, like it's, 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 it's literally not. not there. Like, it's not. And but like the what you what you just said was creative. Yeah. And so the, but the text doesn't need your creativity. It needs. Yeah. That was that was that was your imagination, not interpretation. Yeah. Absolutely. So <laughs> I just thought that was a good word. Anywho, so a friend of mine said, "What what about Hagar in Genesis 16?" I said, "Yeah, no, I, I ain't <laughs> I ain't touching that." Why? Because I knew it was a complicated text. Mm. Like you you have Hagar, this slave, this concubine who was in the household of Abram, Abram, who is made to have his baby. And then she flees the abuse of Sarai. And then she's in the desert and the angel of the Lord meets her and tells her to go back to uh, Abram's house. And so all of that together, you have infertility, you have barrenness, you have suffering, you have abuse, you have slavery, you have uh, uh, surrogacy. Like you have so many mm -hmm. themes yeah. that land on women in a very particular way. Yeah. And so I didn't want to touch it. And then I felt like the Lord was like, nah, but you're going to touch it. So I did. <laughs> and I'm grateful I did. That's dope. I'm grateful because one, I think as a Bible teacher, I think it. It, you kind of build your your textual muscles mm -hmm. by handling texts that might be a bit difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think it reaffirmed God's goodness and faithfulness. Yeah. Um, because I think a lot of people, when it comes to passages like these or like Uzzah in 1 Samuel 6, who touches the ark and drops dead, like those passages that don't sit right with us, we can read them in such a way where we kind of have a cynicism about the Lord mm. because of the text. But I have the disposition that what Jesus has revealed about God must influence how I understand him in texts that complicate me mm. and, or are or, or complicated. So it's like, I presuppose goodness. Like Jesus said to Nicodemus, like, why, like was it Nicodemus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do you call me? No, there was a rich young ruler. Like, uh, why do you call me good? <laughs> Only God is good. So I presuppose goodness in every complicated text. And if you presuppose goodness, you're going to see goodness. So, That's good. I think you should that. read the text. All right. Read so it. if you're in your car, no worries. We're going to read the Bible. Somebody no, tore no, this off. Ain't no no worries. Pull over. Who did this? Pull over. If you're in your car, pull over I right now. I think one of our kids did this. It looks like our dog, December. No, he don't be opening the Bible and eating it. Oh, you but know, that's it, true. it looks like something August would do. Or Sage. Anyway, I'm going to read it so that we have context for the text, okay? Yeah. It is Genesis 16. I'm reading from the ESV. Um, yeah. Now, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Everybody say no children. No children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. I hope y'all are recognizing all the repeated words and themes that are happening. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. 
And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her and she fled from her. Should I keep going or should I pause? Uh, Maybe we should pause. Yeah, pause. Okay. Pause from here. So context has it. We got Sarai, who's Abram's wife. We Eventually, he'll be Abraham. She'll be Sarah, right? Mm-hmm. And Moses, the writer of Genesis, opens up the text by immediately establishing that there's a problem. Yeah. Like, there, there's some tension, which is that Sarai, Abram's wife, has not borne him any children. That don't sound like a problem yeah. to everybody, right? Yeah, yeah. Because everybody don't want kids. So you could read that and be like, oh, she ain't got no kids. That's all good. <laughs> you only know it's a problem if you read four chapters before this one, which is Genesis 12, where God speaks to Abram. That's what I was going to ask next. Like, Go where ahead. did you start? Where did I start? Yeah, because I, I, think, <clears throat> I think a lot of times when you get to a story like this, some people may approach the text like, oh, I should just read this story and just like look at the, the context clues and just kind of see what the story is saying. But a lot the, the Bible is uh, a, a book, right? right. A, continue, like, a, a continued narrative of, of stories or whatever. So like when you started to study this passage, where did you start? Did you start was it a starting place to get you to this point to give you further context of, of this story? Yeah, so... Because this is a narrative that involves people with history, yeah, especially uh, like somebody like Abraham. Abraham is actually an easy slash hard person to teach mm-hmm. because there's so much context about him. You got Abram in Romans. You got Abram in Hebrews. You got Abram in Genesis. He's the father of, of, of faith. Like you got Abram mentioned by the Pharisees and the people of Israel in the Gospels. Like you have a lot so that that means that it's easy because you got a lot to pull from. It's hard because you got to decide what to pull. Yeah. Um. But I think knowing that they are people with a history, it's not fair to just start in Genesis 16 when his story begins in Genesis 12, mm. right? Like if I was to write a story or a sermon about Preston uh, regarding Preston in 2023, I could start there. There's a lot like, oh, Preston is married to Jackie. He got start on the block. He got like a long beard. You know what I'm saying? Like he got four kids. He has a dog. That's cool, but that's actually a short-sighted understanding of you. Yeah. I need to start in 1986, right? Yeah. And so that's the way I started. So I started in Genesis 12, which actually gave me a lot of clarity on Genesis 16, which is that God... Uh, sets him apart, says, A, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Then in Genesis, I think, 15, God makes a covenant with Abram and says, hey, I'm going to give you a son. So that means that the nations, like all of the nations of the earth will be blessed through Abram. This nation will come through a son that Abram will have from his own, not his body, but you get what I'm saying, like the Mm -hmm. sperm and all the things. And so... That means that it, when we get to Genesis 16, it then immediately begins by, but Sarah had no children. Mm. We got a problem. Yeah, yeah. We see like, okay. And God is often <laughs> like that. It's like he, 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 he says things will happen. And then when you get to the point, to a particular point, it's like, okay, how, how? is this, this going to happen, Lord? <laughs> yeah. And the Lord has... Uh, yeah, he has a pattern of like, I'm going to make things happen in such a way where you know it's me. Come on here. <laughs> like, yeah, I said I'm going to do it. But when we get to... Now, he be handing out promises and we be like real excited. Like, oh, father oh, okay. of many nations. That's okay. fire. Okay. You done like made the covenant and you was like a smoking pot and a flaming torch. Like, that's cool. That's that's that, oh, that's awesome. And it's like 10 years go by. Okay. 20 years. <laughs> All right. Where voice come from? You 15 a- years. Oh, okay. We still ain't... <laughs> got no kids right like it's like all right either you're a liar or you're like doing something yeah or you're trying to show us that you're the lord and he's never a liar so i think it's significant to recognize that god's promise to abram involves and hinges on the procreation of a son Mm. and so not having a son in this narrative means that it, it can seem as if god's promise to abram is being threatened 
and it's not being threatened by sin. It's not being threatened by Satan. It's not being threatened by the world. It's being threatened by Sarai's own body, mm. which is crazy. All right, so let's jump into uh, 16. I, I really want to... Chapter 16? Chapter 16. We've been there. I mean, you went back, I'm saying, like... Yeah, I just brought it back to okay. verse 1. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so yeah. we can go to verse 2. Verse 2, that's what Okay, and Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. What I love about that sentence is that Sarai has a very... Um, true theology about the creative sovereignty of God. Mm. And I say creative sovereignty because anytime you see a baby, God created the baby. Mm. He, he made like life. He is its source. You mm. know what I'm saying? Like the body is not the ultimate source of conception. God is. And so she understands mm. that That's the good. reason she is infertile and the reason she is in barren is, is barren is because the Lord has prevented her from bearing children. That's good. But as a teacher of the text, I can't just say that part and not be sensitive to all the women in the room that hear that and actually are discouraged. Yeah. Because that can be very discouraging. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's another question I was going to ask yeah. you. Uh, because you, I saw <clears throat> I saw this sermon being taught at your, at your, uh, at your conference, The it. Glory. Uh, I was like, what's the name of the conference? The Glory that's Conference. That's crazy. <laughs> he forgot the name. Yeah, of yeah, it. yeah. Well, you teach like two thousand women this this text, and so even approaching this text, were there any, um, were there any fears that came up? Were there any fears that came up in you saying like, man, this is a, a woman who, yes, yeah, it acts to do some very very hard things, right. and so not only was it any like like grappling like with you like yeah. as a woman with this text, but how how did you even approach this text knowing? I have to teach this to two thousand women. Well, more than that, yeah. Because well, if I if I have nine glories, two thousand, that's about fifteen, twenty thousand women. I'm 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 able to bring this text before. Yeah, yeah. And that's a lot of people whose story is similar to Sarai's. Yeah. And so I think one, it's a beautiful thing to be a woman, honestly, and and work through this text because I'm not asking the same questions that men would often ask. You know, I'm not saying that men are insensitive because they're human beings, but even when I went through the commentaries, they were not answering the questions I had, such as how would that have felt for Sarai? Yeah. To to not be able to have a baby. How does that how does that feel, especially when God has promised it, yeah. right? Like yeah. like that that's especially considering the context of their community and their day, barrenness and infertility was considered shameful, so so shameful that you were considered to be accursed. Yeah. Because even when you look through Deuteronomy, like one of the curses that came with disobedience was what? Barrenness. Yeah. So it, it looked as if you weren't blessed. Yeah. Like, like God has actually turned his face away. Can you know I say this real quick too? And uh, not to not to get off subject, but this is just it just made me think of this. I, I think this is a this is a, a reason why men in the body should really value women's voices mm. you know what i'm saying because like even when we look in genesis right and um you know god told adam it wasn't good for him to be alone um like humanity couldn't fully um mirror the image of god without both male and female yeah. right and so i think we can we can have like oh women value women's voices to to, to be like we're pro women and all of that it's, it's, it's bigger than that it's about are we not hearing from women and is it preventing us from really seeing a clear picture of the Lord? Right. Right. It's about, it's really, it's really a gospel issue. Yeah. Right. Um, because if women reflect the glory of God in ways that men don't, mm. we miss out. You do. We, we miss out on so much. And so I think what that shows me is I think that we need both men and women looking and knowing how to read the Bible contextually and coming, putting our heads together and saying like, how can we come together and, tr and fully see the the heart of God yeah. in in concerning the text, and so because yeah. you saw things in the text as a woman, yeah, that I just won't see. Yeah, because and it, I can, I can read things about war, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying yeah. about a, about a text as a man that you just couldn't understand. Because it's it's no different than you being from Chicago. If you watch a documentary that is placed in Chicago, oh, let me give a, be a better example. 
I remember there was a, a a show that was supposedly based in Chicago, but they were they had these actors that I could tell weren't from Chicago. Yeah. And if if I didn't live five years in Chicago, if I wasn't married with somebody from Chicago, yeah. if I didn't have history in Chicago, I wouldn't have been able to even discern those kinds of dysfunctions yeah. in the show, right? Yeah. And so there's a sense we of, don't say son. <laughs> Every time they do a every time they do a Chicago movie, they make or it Chicago, New York. They make it New York, and they think urban culture, especially if it's not the South, is New York. Yeah, and it's just like, bro, we don't talk like that. Yeah, we don't say yo. Yeah, so being connected to you being from Chicago, but me being connected and living in Chicago meant that I have a certain social location that allows me to ask or think through or notice certain things that don't correspond with the social location I live in. So bringing that back to this text, as a woman, right, in friendship with other women who are dealing with and walking through barrenness, when I come across a text that says, now Sarai Abram's wife had borne him no children, I'm not going to just move on, Yeah. right? I'm not just going to be like, oh, okay, cool, but she eventually had child. No, I'm going to stay there and say, huh, it makes sense why she's eventually going to create a strategy for having children because mm. that that means a lot to her. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So I put makeup on my body. <laughs> That's good. That's a very womanly thing. So she says, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. And I know that, that uh, that's discouraging to many women, especially women who have tried um, to have a child through IVF, who have prayed, who have fasted. And there's all these internal pressures and external pressures that come with that, which is like you have internal shame that says, I'm not woman enough. I'm mm. not wife enough. I'm not good enough. You have external pressure, especially with people uh, outside of the Christian community or inside the Christian community will say like, oh, you just don't have enough faith. Mm. You're not praying enough. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're, like it's something wrong with you. That's why you remain childless. Yeah. And what they don't recognize that they're doing is that they're putting the burden of barrenness on the woman instead of on the Lord, who the Bible consistently says that he is the one that opens and closes the womb. What, what, what would you say about her strategy? Like for people who would just wrestle with the, the fact that she created a strategy to have the children, would you say it was a lack of faith or would you say it was... It was totally a lack of faith. It, but, but, but also too... Um, is it commendable in any kind of way? No, sin is never commendable. Okay. So um, because the Lord has made a promise. Mm -hmm. God is a man that cannot lie. Yeah. So much so that, remember, before this chapter is Genesis 15, mm -hmm. where God makes a covenant with Abraham, where, where he has Abraham slaughter these animals, Abraham goes to sleep, and God manifests himself as a pot and a flaming torch and walks through the blood of these animals saying, basically, metaphorically speaking, if I don't keep my promise to you, my the, the blood of these animals, wow. I, I will be just like them. The yeah. blood will be on my, my hands. hands. Yeah. And so, so God has made it very clear he's going to do what he said. Yeah. But the problem is, is that one thing you'll notice in Genesis 16 is that it gives you a timeline. It says in verse three, so after Abram listened to the voice of his wife, no, so after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, meaning it's only been 10 years since they've been in the land of Canaan, and she doesn't have any more patience. Mm. That's the problem, wow. is that you are unwilling to wait yeah. on the timing of the Lord. And isn't that all of us? All the time. When you even move forward into Exodus, I think it's 33, they build the 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 golden calf because they like, hey, Moses been on the mountain for four days. We don't know where yet. Impatience really is at the root of a lot of idolatry. Yeah. But we don't want to say that. And our forgetfulness. Say that again. And our forgetfulness. Explain that. We we like because it, it's not just impatience with the people of Israel, but it was the fact that they forgot. Like you literally saw God split a whole sea. Mm hmm. You like, like, literally, like, to go back to your analogy is that God made a way out of no way with the ah, whole pot and all of that. Yeah, it's like not only did He take you from the land of e Egypt, mm -hmm. but when y'all got to a roadblock, mm -hmm. which was the sea, mm -hmm. 
It's like, how are we going to get to the other side? Yeah. What did he do? He created a way. Yeah. <laughs> right? I don't know. And he literally split the sea. Yeah, he did. And y'all was walking and like seeing land. like, oh, that's a blue whale. Yeah, they did. And they're not even falling on Prince me. Prince of Egypt. Because cause, cause that's what I thought, you know, that's beautiful. a blue, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And like y'all literally walked through a sea because God made a way. Mm -hmm. And so y'all here, so it's not just your lack of impatience, but mm -hmm. your lack of remembrance come on you 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 have the inability to to remember and i would imagine what God has done for you i would imagine that the discipline because it is a discipline of remembering is actually what can cultivate hope right mm -hmm. impatience don't come out of nowhere yeah so i wonder if impatience also comes out like like that there's a step like step one is remembering step two is hope step three is therefore endurance and steadfastness yeah yeah but if we don't do the remembering then we lose the hope and therefore function in impatience and then don't endure yeah yes yeah no okay. i think that was good i was trying to create a path yeah yeah. No, i think that was good so yeah she's sinning and you know one one right way you could know she's sinning is that because verse two says when she comes up with this idea that, hey, go into my servant, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. Two ways you can understand that. One, she says, go into my servant, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. That's interesting because she just said that it's the Lord that prevented me from bearing a child. Mm. So you would, would assume then that if the Lord has prevented it, then the Lord can give it. But she didn't. She doesn't say, hey, the Lord has prevented us from having a baby. Let's pray. Mm. Let's fast. Let, let's 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 seek let's, the Lord. Let's welcome in community to help us stir up hope because it may be that I will obtain children by him. She mm. says it may be that I will obtain children by her, which tells me that she's actually misplaced her hope. She's put her hope mm. on somebody else. That's good. She's put her hope on somebody else to bring this baby into the world instead of the Lord. Yeah. The another another clue that there's it's sinful is that it says and Abram listened to the voice of his of uh and Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. What does that sound like? It's the same language of Abram Adam listened to the voice of Eve. Sarai, meaning this is a textual clue that Moses is giving us that there is sin mm. happening among them. Um and so he does. They they pull aside Hagar the Egyptian. Now, the question I'm ask you, where did Hagar come from? Cuz how does how does a wife how does a wife in Canaan, Sarah Get a slave from Egypt. Those are two different nations. You tell us. You study the text. <laughs> Let's turn to Genesis 12. You got your Bible. Yeah, yeah. You ain't going to turn to it. You don't care. Yeah, you go, You can read it, though. Okay. So in Genesis 12, there's a famine in the land. Uh, Abram goes down to Egypt to escape the famine that's happening. Obviously, he takes Sarai. He takes his whole family, all the things. He goes to Sarai. He like, hey, you're really pretty. And because you're pretty... When Pharaoh and his people see you, they're going to take you and then they're going to kill me. So this is what you're going to do. You're going to say that you're my sister <laughs> so, that, so that they won't kill me. Like they'll spare me for your sake, which yeah. is completely obnoxious. But I want you to notice that it, it shows you that both Abraham and Sarah are very strategic people. Mm. They, they both know how to come up with plans and strategies for how to how to secure themselves, how to how to make sure that they're going to be OK. Yeah, yeah. So when you move forward. Oh, so eventually the Pharaoh and them people, they see Sarah. They like, oh, she pretty. They take her and they bring her to Pharaoh's house. Somebody could read that. like, oh, she's just going in the house real quick. No, sis, she's going and taking into a harem. <laughs> She's going and taking and to, to be a concubine yeah, yeah. of a foreign king. Now, when you fast forward back to Genesis 16, that's significant. So she's taken into a harem to be a concubine of a foreign king. And then eventually, Pharaoh, he starts to give Abram all these gifts. He's like, thank you for giving me your sister. She's so beautiful. <laughs> and imagine as a husband how bogus that is. Oh, my gosh. Think I'll about that. Boiling. She's not my sister. <laughs> <laughs> Did you growl? My sister. Did you do that as a as a? I could just see you doing that when you was two. I did growling. No, no, I used to always like like talking to my breath because I didn't want my mom to slap me. So like, I knew if I talked back, I say some real smart shit, hit me in my face, and so I'm like, shut up. <laughs> 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 no, but for real though, like you can't. What are you gonna say? He, he can't talk, so it's like that has to be like a a deep wrestle. 
but he did it. This, but this is how crazy it is. He he told her to say that she was his sister. He let her be taken by Pharaoh's people. And Pharaoh was so happy to get his wife that he gave him wealth. Uh. He gave him male servants. He gave him animals. And he gave him female servants, meaning that Hagar was a gift to Abram in light of his wife being enslaved in Pharaoh's house. That's so sad. That's crazy. Now, mind you, he don't try to get her out. He he don't he don't he don't go to war because he went to war for Lot. Mm. When when Lot had beef earlier yep. in Genesis, he he pulled two up two three hundred of his men to get Lot out. He don't do that for his wife though. Mm-mm. The person that rescues Sarai out of Pharaoh's house is God Himself. So then, when we get to Genesis sixteen, I find it fascinating. I find it interesting that what Sarai does is very similar to what Sarai endured, mm, which is do? that she takes her slave, she takes Hagar, who is a foreign woman, and subjects her and subjugates her to be the concubine Repeated of a foreign Repeated behavior. Man. She replicates the same exact Mm-mm. trauma. Isn't that all? All of us. Repeated behavior. It is. Wow. And so I think that's important to draw out because we tend to only think about abuses of power coming from men. Mm-hmm. When this is an abuse of power coming from a woman. Yeah. A woman who has also been abused by power. I, 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 you know what's crazy? I've been seeing a lot of videos on Instagram of just women attacking m- women. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. in the in the name of speaking up for men. Mm-hmm. And I wonder how many of y'all women just been abused by men. Or by women. Or by women. Mm -hmm. And then you just, you know, when I was growing up, it used to be like pimps, Mm. you know. And the pimps will keep a lot of them women in in check by using other women to do it. That's deep. Right? And they're called like madams or something? Yeah, they're called madams. Mm -hmm. And so, like, (laughs) you know, these women also came from places of abuse. And so... It's just learned behavior. Yeah. And it's an experiential behavior. Yeah. And it's and it's wicked. Yeah. It, it really comes from a wicked place because it's as if having the power and being able to flex it in subjugating someone else makes you feel powerful when that's incredibly weak. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I think I can empathize to a certain degree with Sarai because she's she's doing what is normative in her cultural context. Mm-hmm. In her context, it was normal for a, bar- a barren or infertile woman to use her slave as a surrogate, mm-hmm. right? But the, the 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 dynamic of it that is problematic is that the surrogate has no say or consent in her wanting to mm. bear the baby or become a concubine. So you auto- you automatically kind of put her in a position not to be treated as a whole human being with mm. dignity and yeah. honor, right? That's good. Like, I think that's different from culturally now today where people uh, go get surrogates or whatever if they can't be. Like, the surrogate can say, yes, I want to, you know, have your baby. Yes, I will carry this baby. Hagar didn't have that option, so much so that when you look at this text, you never see them ask Hagar about Hagar. They never say, Hagar, hey, Hagar, do you want to be with Abram? Do you want to have his baby? When you have the baby, do you want to give it to Sarai? They don't even use her name. The only reason we know Hagar's name is because Moses says it. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? And so this whole dynamic is really problematic. Yeah, that's good. I I don't want to skip along here, but I definitely want to get to the part where she is approached by the Lord. The Lord. Mm-hmm. And so I, I can we can we can we go to that part for the sake of time? Sake well, of time. We don't care about time no more. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ain't no thirty minutes with. Oh, it's been, it has been like an hour and thirty minutes with the Perry's. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> oh, you mean in general? Yeah. 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 I'm just hearing that's what the Saints want. But uh, verse, I, I do want to point out a couple things, though. In verse 6, so back up. Sarai hasn't had any children for Abram. She creates a strategy. The strategy is that she gives Hagar her concubine or her slave, her servant, 
as a concubine slash wife to Abram. He goes into Hagar, she conceived. Because she's a surrogate, that means that the child that comes from Abram Abram and Sarai's union will legally be Sarah's child. Mm. When she conceives, the Bible says that she looks on her mistress with contempt. Some people have looked at that like, oh, like why she why she being contemptuous? It's because contempt means to take lightly. It means that Sarai's position has been lowered in mm-hmm. Hagar's mind because you've done like what this is what Sarai did. You you you've made her not just a slave but a wife. Mm. But you also allowed her to be a wife that carries a baby that you want. And so now we see Hagar has power and mm. she's flexing her power. <laughs> you wow. know what I'm saying? Like imagine yeah. being a slave and it's like, ah. Oh, yeah, I got power now. Uh, you want to treat me crazy? Well, I got your baby. <laughs> it's in my, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. So it's, it's like it's like house slaves. She she's probably ru- walking around rubbing her belly, you know what I'm saying, over the lady. So Sarai goes to Abram's like, "Hey, she tripping like I, like the Lord is going to judge you for what's happening," which is just psychotic low key. Well, I'm not going to say she's psychotic. She's just she's not the woman of faith in this moment that we see in Hebrews. Yeah. Which is actually kind of Fair. Yeah. Because I think we've all had seasons where if they were written in books, people would judge us. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I, I, I guess I'm a look. That's actually what I love about the Bible the most, especially when I first came to faith, not growing up in a church and struggling if what it was the Bible true compared to other faiths. It, it was like the Bible didn't highlight people's highlight reels mm. mm-hmm. you know it didn't mm-hmm. give us moses was a straight murderer Mo- moses was a murderer david we already knew he was bogus mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying killing that dude killing you know what I'm killing the dude to get his wife and all of that mm-hmm. like it, it it shows you the reality of a person's journey mm-hmm. you know paul before he was converted he was straight murking cats you know what i'm saying like and so like the bible is so consistent in showing you the progressive nature of how god sanctifies his people mm. for his glory yeah and i you know i thought that was like dope I yeah think that's actually one of the dopest things in the bible yeah it because it, it what it does I, I remember hearing this from somebody the bible was very honest about everything so that when the messiah comes you know he's the Messiah, because mm-hmm. he's the only perfect one. Yeah. He, so, so you can't be confused and think, ah, Moses is the like, because in Genesis three, you know, it, it says that uh, the 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 seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head, and people are reading the scriptures, waiting on who that seed is going to be. Is it Moses? Ah, uh, nah, he killed somebody. Yeah. Is it Abraham? Ah, uh, nah, he he keep giving his wife over to these kings because he, he's scary and he weird. Is it is it David? Ah, uh, nah, he over here, you know, sleeping with Bathsheba. So when Jesus comes and it says in him was no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth it's like oh he's here now yeah yeah that's, that's the one that's going to crush the head of the serpent that's why it's always confusing to me when like people in the world be trying to like call out christians for like you know not being perfect it's like y'all haven't read the bible <laughs> ain't none of them perfect either <laughs> it's like you haven't read any of the scriptures no like we jacked up yeah and they was jacked up too yeah but we the difference is we put our hope in the one who's not jacked up. and abram and Sarai's stories don't end here because even Abram, even though he listens to the voice of his wife, we have this moment in Genesis. When is that? Yeah, Genesis 22. When God, when he finally does have Isaac, his son, and God comes and say, hey, sacrifice your son for me. Mm. Like this is the same man that gave his wife up. Because he was unwilling to sacrifice his own life. Yeah. Who now gets to a point where he has the the faith and the knowledge of God where he's now willing to sacrifice his son to, because he trusts God that much. So it's like, I think because we can read these chapters back to back, we don't recognize that they are, these are decades passing yeah. before us that mm-hmm. we can read in 30 minutes. Um. So yeah, so uh, what happened? Hagar, she fell away. She treated her with contempt. And then Abram was like, your power, I, like he restores um, Hagar's power over his servant or whatever, or her servant. And then it says that Sarai deals harshly with Hagar. The dealing harsh, harshly, some commentators say that because it's very similar to uh, the language used of the Egyptians, how they dealt with Israel, they mm-hmm. dealt harshly 
that that couldn't mean that they just imposed heavy labor labor on her. And I'm never I didn't say this in the sermon because in sermons you can't give all these facts because it's not a lecture. Yeah. yeah. But this is low key a how do you call it? This is a preview of the Exodus narrative hmm. because you have Hagar from Egypt who flees to Canaan. And eventually you're going to have Israel in Egypt that flees to Canaan. Did I just say that wrong? Yeah, I think you said Canaan twice. So Hagar <laughs> is a, an Egyptian servant who goes into the land of Canaan. Mm -hmm. But then you're going to have Israel who will be in Egypt who is go, goes back into the land of Canaan. Like there's this reversal okay. that God is already prepping our minds to yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get what That's all I'm now. saying. Um, so she goes and they say that the text finds her in the wilderness on the way to Shur. That's significant because you'll see that in Exodus where they will be in the wilderness on the way to Shur, which means that Hagar is on her way back to Egypt. She's trying to go home. Yeah. I think we need to feel that for a second. Yeah. Like she's been in this foreign man's house. Now she's pregnant with his baby, a baby she ain't even asked for. And the wife deals harshly with her. And she's like, you know what? I got to go. Like, y'all got me messed up. Yeah. And so I, I'm going to walk all the way back to another country. She like deuces. Y'all got me messed up. Mind you, between Canaan and Egypt is 300 miles. Oof. That's a month of walking. No wonder why she was thirsty. <laughs> Don't the text that she was drinking? It, it doesn't say that. Oh, okay. I'm reading into the text. <laughs> It's okay. I'm sure she was. We can, we can assume that <laughs> she was thirsty. She, she. I'm sure she was thirsty. She stopped to get some Kool Aid or something. Wow, but she's on the way to sure, and she should die. Like that's kind of like what might. And, and what and what had happened when she, you know, she was she was in this wilderness. So it says that the angel of the Lord found her. I mm. love the word found because it means you're looking. Yeah. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water. Spring is also the Hebrew word for eye. Yeah. So next to the eye, she is seen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He finds her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. So remember, this this means that she is in between, like she's out, she's coming out of Canaan on her way to Egypt. And he speaks to her and he says, Hagar. Servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? This is the first time in this narrative where we see somebody ask Hagar about Hagar. Wow. I love that part. That's amazing. Because it, it the, the Lord acknowledges her. The yeah. Lord calls her by her name. The Lord asks her a question. Like he gives her the dignity of even showing up as if he's curious. Yeah, yeah. And I love the fact you said... You love the fact that it said it found her. Not only does it indicate that the Lord was, the Lord was looking for her, but she, you know, Hagar wasn't looking for the Lord, and mm. isn't that mm -hmm. so evident of us? It's like, mm. like the Lord often finds us not when we're necessarily looking for Him, that's but good. we're looking for a way out. I should have put that in my sermon because that's not in there. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we're we're we're, we're not. She she's 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 searching for something. Mm. And she doesn't really know what she's, she's searching. She's searching for safety. Safety. Freedom. And security and deliverance. But see, that's 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 the time when the Lord comes. That's when he comes. Keep going. When you when you are at the at the end of your of your your Go rope, ahead and say it, your rope. Your rope. When yeah. you're at the end of it and you don't know what to go. I wonder who created that idiom. I don't know. Go either. ahead. But uh, you know, and so that's just a beautiful picture of the gospel. Mm. You know, she wasn't looking for God, but God was looking for her. You know? But I love when it says when when the when the uh, what what verse is that? No, I don't know. When the angels ask, her, "Oh, where you come from? Where are you where are you coming from? And where, where are you, you going? going?" Oftentimes in the text, when God asks a question, we well we not know. Oftentimes, all the times, all the time, he never he's never asked any question because he doesn't know the answer. Mm -hmm. He's trying to reveal something. Mm -hmm. And so, what do you what do you take from that when when he says, "Where do you come from? Where are you going?" Well. I think it could be easy for us to make our allow our imagination to take that question too far. Hmm. In what way? So our imagination might start to apply this in ways where is the Lord asking you where you came from? And hmm. is the Lord asking you where you going? Where did you come from this? Did you And I think there's room for that kind of 
of introspection. Because the text, well, because this part is a question geared towards her, but it shouldn't be all about us. Is that what you're saying? I, I think what I'm saying is I think the bigger question is if God, when he asks a question in Scripture, it is a revelation of some sort. Mm-hmm. I think the safest way to understand why he's asking it is to say, what is he revealing about himself in the asking? Mm. And so for God to say, where have you come from and where are you going, is really for God to invite her into a conversation with himself. On, he teach. already knows the answer you to better, the question. You better teach your little pretty face off. It's like it's like in Genesis <laughs> In Genesis 3, after Adam sinned, Adam, where are you? He knows where he is. Mm. But if Adam answers the question, God has actually given him an opportunity to confess. That's so good. (laughs) Wait a minute. I would throw this whole ESV. It's a thick Bible, so this is one of them grandma Bibles. (laughs) That would hurt my feelings. I would you would be dealing harshly with me. That's (laughs) that's so good though. So that's what I'm I I so I I think it's safer to say. God is just creating space for a conversation with her. So he's creating space yeah. for her to to dialogue with himself. And so if God is asking like even when he says Cain, where is your brother? He's creating space mm. for him to to deal with his anger and to yeah. deal with his sin. And so it's not it's not all this like who told it, what, you who where told you, you where were you naked? come from? Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> let's stick to what God is revealing about himself instead of putting our imagination in the text and making it say something it's not saying. So the so the question is, what is God trying to reveal about himself? He with Hagar he does reveal that he's a God that sees mm. the text tells us yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying so she says he says where have you come from she answers the question yeah. she says I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai he also says where are you going she does not answer that part because she but, don't know but guess who does God he mm. says the angel of the Lord says to her uh return to your mistress and submit to her now, I, I need to point out real quick that the angel of the Lord is the Lord mm. because you see angel of the Lord in Scripture often. And sometimes we can get really caught up by the word angel and we think, oh, angel, created being that God made, this seraphim, cherubim, um, you know, like the angels that came to Lot, et cetera, et cetera. But angel is a category. All it means is messenger. Mm. So that means that the context of the passage has to influence what kind of messenger we're dealing with. Mm. What does the context of the passage say here? It says that she will eventually say in verse th- 13, so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of singing. Mm. So that means that this is not the cherubim that were around or seraphim that were around the throne in Isaiah 6 saying, holy, holy, holy. This is the one on the throne yeah. who is meeting her. In the wilderness, not 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 in Jerusalem, not in the temple, uh, not in heaven, not in glory, not on Mount Sinai, in a desert place. That's good. The angel of the Lord comes to her and reveals himself. That's good. That's good. You want me to keep going? No, no, no. I, I just love I just love that. I love the fact that she that she she leaves this place. But she doesn't really know where she's going. Mm-mm. Right. And that's I'm I, I'm I'm reflecting on my own life when I left so many different difficult circumstances, but I didn't really know where I was going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just aimless. I was just I was like, you know, I'm leaving what I don't like, but I'm 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 walking aimlessly Mm -hmm. because I I don't I don't know. Um, But because God saw me, Mm -hmm. and he he he, before he before I was formed into my mother's womb, Mm -hmm. he saw me, right? He came and he met me and said, you know what? I know. You know the life that you lived wasn't 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 the move. It wasn't it wasn't the life that you wanted, and I know you don't know where you're going. But you know I'm going to give you vision. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you direction. I'm going to give you myself. But here's the hard here's the hard part. I think this is this is a a prosperity preacher's Achilles heel. Mm. That's probably why they don't teach teach this text. Which is he tells her where she's going, which is back into suffering. Mm. That's the vision he gives her. Yeah, yeah. It, it ain't, oh, yeah, I'm going to set you on the high mountain. I'm going to let you go all the way. No, no, no. Go back and submit to Sarai. Yeah. That's what makes this text complicated. And this is one of the things that we pray for one day in the bed when you mm-hmm. was thinking about, you know, teaching this text. Because we, I knew, you knew that you were going to teach this, you know, amongst women. So many women with so many different backgrounds who 
probably have, you know, suffered a, a great deal of, you know, oppression, mm -hmm. you know, uh, persecution, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of these things. And so for you to teach a text, man, that says this woman left a bad situation, the Lord met her and told her to go back. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's hard. Yeah. Well, one thing I think we, there's a few things we need to be careful of, which is this is descriptive, mm -hmm. not prescriptive. Explain that. So prescriptive is like uh, the Ten Commandments or uh, when they go to Jesus and say, hey, uh, what do you say the greatest commandments are? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, right? That is, that is prescriptive, meaning I, I am prescribing this for everyone. Everybody is to obey God with all of their heart, all of their mind, all of their soul. This is descriptive in that they are telling us a story that applies to Hagar, mm -hmm. right? And so God came, comes to Hagar mm -hmm. and tells Hagar to go back and submit to Sarai. And telling everybody so, else. Yeah, so I would, I would hate if someone would abuse this passage and use it as reason for you to go back and submit to an abusive husband. Yeah. Or to submit to an abusive job. Yeah. It, th th that you can't take a narrative that is very specific to this individual woman and apply it to every other woman in every other context. Yeah. That's not Because God has a particular biblical. plan in this story, and his plan might not be the plan for everybody. Correct. And so, yeah. Correct. Because God also cares about safety. Yeah. God also cares about dignity. God also cares about justice. Yeah. Let's be clear. And so I think if a woman is in an abusive situation with a husband or a man or whatever the case may be, I don't think the Lord will be out here like, yeah, go go submit to him even if it'll cost you, cost you your life. That's not God's heart. Yeah, because, I, because, God, because God does care about safety. I think the the main thing that we have to just trust is, is, is God good, because if God is good, you can obey Him even when it seems like He's telling you to do something crazy. Because you know, if He's telling you to go back, He's good enough to protect you when you do. Yes. And so that's that's the main thing. It's kind of like, okay, you're telling her to go back to an abusive situation, but it's like, am I not the God even over this abusive situation? And even we have to go back to the text. It says that Sarai dealt harshly. We don't know what that means. Yeah. Right. And so we don't know if that that just could mean harsh labor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could mean she was mean to her verbally. Like it could it could mean physical abuse, but we don't know. Yeah. And so again, it would be a disservice to people and even to this text to apply this universally to everyone who is in a hard situation. That's good. That's good. Um, that's one. Two, we also don't want to read our African-American heritage into this text. Let's talk about it. Because we could see the word slave and servant and be like, see, the white people was right. You know what I'm saying? Like slaves submit to your masters. It's like Old Testament slavery is not the same mm -hmm. as pre-Civil War, pre -Civil War chattel slavery. Mm -hmm. One, this is not race-based. She is not a slave because she is black. Yeah, she yeah. is not a slave because she comes from Africa, right? Two, it's not intergenerational. Yeah. In uh, pre-Civil War chattel slavery, if you were born into slavery, you stayed in slavery. Yeah, you had no Your choice. children, 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 like generations worth of slave. There was no freedom, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not intergenerational and it's not a uh, lifelong. Yeah, yeah. We we eventually see in Genesis 20 something when they paid off that. Where no, she she's eventually emancipated. Yeah, yeah. Like she her and uh, Sarah get into it because Isaac laughs or Ishmael laughs at Isaac or something like that. And the Lord goes to Abram and says, send her on her way. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, let her go. And mm -hmm. where does she go? She goes back to Egypt. And so it's just not the same. So, again, when we get to the point where he says, hey, go and submit to Sarah, do not read your context or another woman's context or even your heritage into this text. That's good. Let the text say what the text means. That's good. That's good. Now, back to the point. God <laughs> sends her back into suffering. Why? You want me to say? Yeah. Like, being loved by God does not absolve us from difficulty. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I, yeah, because... Cause, I, when I think about suffering, I think about um, my mind automatically goes to First Peter four twelve, where it talks about um, you know 
not suffering as an evildoer, not mm. suffering as a meddler, but it says suffer as one who does not, uh, don't suffer as, basically said don't suffer as one who does not know the Lord, right? Is it 1 Peter? It's 1 Peter 4, uh, 12. Ahead. Turn to it real quick. Because I'm, 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 I'm like butchering the text. I'm trying to like remember. Because I actually think it's in Peter. 1 Peter 4, starting at the 12 verse, it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, though something was strange was happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may, rejo that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. For if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. Uh, but let n none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or, or an evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God in their name. And I love that because it's literally just talking about like, you know, the it basically saying the whole world is going to suffer, right? Mm -hmm. Christians and non-Christians. But after the world suffers, there's more suffering, right? Mm -hmm. But after we suffer, there's glory. Yeah, yeah. Right? But not only that, suffering produces an endurance in us. Yeah. It produces, it refines us, yeah. right? Uh, I love at the end of this passage, it says, um, it says, for this, uh, for this time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And so, essentially, what it's saying is like God is going to use the, the judge the whole world by way of suffering, mm -hmm. but He's going to judge the world um, differently than how He judge. Um, he's going to judge the world differently than how He judge the church, right? He's going to use suffering mm -hmm. to condemn the world, mm -hmm. but He's, he's going to use suffering to purify his church. Mm -hmm. It's going to purify us. It's going to refine us. So when he comes, he can judge us good, mm -hmm. right? And so this suffering, God is using suffering to essentially judge the whole world. But he's not. The, our suffering is not going to be used ultimately to 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 judge us, to condemn us. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be used so that God can come back and judge us holy. And so when I see her, I see this woman being shaped. That's good. By the Lord, through her suffering, right? Um, God is sanctifying her. It's not that God is being cruel to her. God literally has her in mind. I'm preparing you mm. for myself, you know yeah. what I'm saying, in a way. And so, I, I don't know. That's, that's what I think about suffering. That's excellent because I think when I think of Hagar and I think of me and I think of what I've been through or what I've seen other people go through, I think many times we are encouraged by the fact that God sees us mm -hmm. in our suffering. That is encouraging to know that, like, okay, God has his eye on me, that God really, he, he's not blind. He doesn't have a blind eye to my suffering. Like, even when you look at uh, before God uh, freed Israel out of Egypt, he says, I have seen the affliction of my people mm -hmm. in, is in Egypt. I have heard their cry. I know their sufferings. Like, like he it's a very, um, God is very much alive as it relates to his people, yet at the same time. So I, I think we, we're, we're encouraged by God's seeing us, but I wonder how often we look at our own suffering and see it as an opportunity to identify with Christ himself, mm -hmm. where it's like, yeah, he sees me, but have I ever considered that he went through the same things and yet is sinless? Like, like if Christ went through suffering, if 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 like Philippians two, for example, like he let me read it. Oh, I, I can't read it. Philippians two, it says Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of what a servant. Mm -hmm. What was Hagar? A servant, servant. Yeah. being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, obedient, submission, hmm. even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, meaning like God tells Hagar to do 
what Christ himself would eventually incarnate and do. Mm, you know what I'm saying? Good. Like the Lord, the angel of the Lord who who sees her will then become man and submit himself to suffering, submit himself to human weakness, even going so far as to become obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Mm -hmm. And so if we have a master who himself submitted to suffering as in, in obedience to God, how could we think that he would require anything less of us? That's good. That's real good. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, God isn't telling you to do nothing he ain't didn't. He did, did it. Like, he yeah. did far more exceedingly and abundantly above than what Hagar was at. That was minor. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it wasn't hard. I'm not saying it wasn't difficult. But she was not the creator of the universe. She was not God. She was not the Alpha and Omega. She was not the King of Kings. She, she was not him. So for him to choose to suffer when he himself is also a king mm -hmm. does not make any sense. Yeah, that's good. Um, now, we can wrap this up now. Um, I think it's important to know that when God sends her back into Abram's house, he does not send her back empty handed. The, the angel of the Lord gives her promises and it gives her assurance, mm -hmm. which is good news. The angel of the Lord says, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord said, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. Who does that sound like? Abram, mm -hmm. like he, he gives her a similar promise that he gave to Abram in Genesis 12, which is that she will not just have a son, but she will have a nation. Yeah. Um, back in those times, having children was understood as. Uh, so, for example, earlier in the text, she says, uh, go into my servant Hagar. It may be that I will be. What does she say? That I shall obtain children by her. When you look at the Hebrew, it actually says that I shall be built up by her. Mm. Meaning that having a child was seen and considered as having the same stability as a house. Mm. So imagine not just having a child, but a nation. Wow. Like God ain't making her a house. He's making her a mansion. That's good. <laughs> like he's giving her ultimate security and stability. So that's one promise. He also says that you will bear a son. His name will be Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall, shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. He will dwell over against his kinsmen. That's actually a consequence because the Ishmaelites will be in direct opposition to Israel, which was a consequence of Sarai's sin. Yet at the same time, what God is promising is that if he is a wild donkey, he don't mean that he's going to be ugly. He mean like that he's going to be a stallion. Yeah. He's going to be free. Free. He's not wow. going to be subjugated. Yeah. He's not going to be a servant. Mm. He's not going to be a slave That's like good. his mother has had to be. And what is the assurance? The assurance is in verse 13. So she called the name. Of, no, it's not. It's in verse <laughs> 11. He says, you shall call his name Ishmael. Because the Lord has listened to your affliction. It's really easy to skip past that. Mm -hmm. As a like, as a when you study the Bible, take your time. Like, like, take your time. Like all of it can preach. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. His name means God hears. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine this little boy being born, and every time Abram and Sarai say his name, they're reminded about the nature of God. Oof. God hears, stop playing with the da da da. Mm. God hears, come come to dinner. That's God, good. like like every they have to they have to testify something true about God. Yeah. Even in saying His name, and it's a truth that actually condemns their sin. Because if God can hear her suffering, God can also hear your sin. Yeah. And so I mm. think I can imagine that in them saying His name over and over and over again, it actually gave them pause in how they treated Hagar. Yeah, absolutely. But it also I think points back to the intentionality of God because. He understands his creation. Mm -hmm. He understands that we are people, like we said in the beginning, that have the tendency to forget. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, I'm going to name, have y'all name him something mm -hmm. where y'all are forced to remember. Which is all the Old Testament. Right. <laughs> you know, That's why we need to name our children better names. Because <laughs> these names was always like prophecies or testimonies. You know what I'm the saying? The Brickashaw, come here. Because <laughs> even Isaac. Come in, the Brickashaw. Isaac's name. What does that mean? <laughs> Isaac's name means Laughter. And that don't mean nothing if you don't remember that later when the angel comes and speaks to uh, Abram and says, hey, your, 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 your wife is going to give birth to a son this time next year. What, is, what does Sarah do? She laughs. That's our, that's our main takeaway. Name y'all kids some Old Testament names. <laughs> our, our sound guy, his name back there. Put, put the camera on him. His name is Abishai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a powerful name. That is a powerful name. I think. But yeah. But uh, <laughs> This was good, though. 
Let me finish. I, I wasn't trying to wrap you up. I'm just saying. Oh, you're encouraged? Encouraged. Okay. Very encouraged. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly here, I've seen him who looks after me. When I've taught this to women, I've tried to point out how sometimes when you read passages like this, you can import your feelings into the text and translate it in mm. such a way that it honors your feelings and actually dishonors the text. Yeah. And so you could say, eh, like, God is bogus. And you go into it looking at God a certain kind of way. But have you given Hagar the dignity of defining how we should understand him? Mm. She doesn't respond to him sending her back with contempt in the same way she does Sarai. She doesn't respond with confusion even. She responds in praise. Yeah. She says, you are a God of seeing. Therefore, Hagar's response to what God calls her to do mm. should inform our response to how we understand what he called her to do. That's good. Let the text help you understand the text. Amen. Verse, I'm going to end it by saying that in verse 15, it says, And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore. They're not even mention this Sarah. Notice that. Ishmael. That's a beautiful text because it, it seems so small, but that means that Hagar went back to Abram's house, told Abram what God said, and he listened to her. Wow. He honored what he believed. Like, this is a man mm -hmm. in Old Testament times with the, where, with the men named their children, right? Yeah, yeah. And so he believed her testimony of what God had said. That is significant when you move forward to John 5, because how does this po text point to Jesus? When we get to John 5, we see there is a woman in a wilderness place next to a spring of water who meets a man who reveals himself as God. And she ends up leaving her water jar, goes to the town and gives her testimony about what he said. Mm. And she says, I have seen a man who has told me everything I have ever done. She is basically saying, I've met Elroy. Wow. I have seen the God who has seen me. That's, That's how you point that text to Jesus. Oof. That's it. Mic drop. That was, that good. was good. Look at you. Ditto. Peace. Bye y'all.